bit after 12 and we'll get going in a couple minutes once everybody that we are expecting has a chance to join us if they're running just a minute or two late. Okay. Got a few more. Okay, I'm gonna gonna get going now. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Dave, and I am the founder of Graze and Gather. Which uh, Facebook actually just reminded me that two years ago. Um, is when this thing really took off for us because of an article in blog to uh, you know as a lot of you know we got our start at the beginning of the pandemic when all of us small farms were in a place of panic uh, because farmers markets were closing um, restaurants were closing and a lot of us had no idea how we were going to survive the next six months is what we all thought at the time um, it's now been two years and yeah, it was that blog TO that really just kind of sh shone a spotlight on what we were attempting to do at the time when we were called the virtual farmers market. And while some things have changed since then, you know, the the original intent of being a new way for the food from small farms to reach people has stayed the same. And because while the immediate urgency and crisis of the time is gone, and upon reflection, the the systemic challenges facing small farms are still persist, right? And that's why we're still just pushing forward, trying to create some new way and kind of get more people involved in this community. And one of those ways that we're doing this is, is through these lunch and learns. Um, because the piece that a lot of us are missing, um, both the homes, all of you that we're feeding and the farmers, is that opportunity to talk about the food and how it's being grown. Um, how to best enjoy it um all of and so these lunch and learns well virtual and something that we're having some success with and we really enjoy doing we're we've also learned this is our third one and one of the things we've realized is people want to hear a little bit of the politics a little bit of the farmers talking shop about what their frustrations are why they make the decisions that they're making and so that's why this one well it's focuses on the spring celebrations when we get into lamb and ham um, we call it the politics of sustainable meat eating because we understand that there's a lot of discussion about raising animals and what that means for the environment. And I will admit that there was a time in my life, probably about 10 years ago, when I stopped eating beef. Um, and I'll share why really quickly. Um, I had recently traveled down to uh, Central America and had witnessed the deforestation that was happening um, down there around basically clear cutting a lot of the rainforest to raise cattle. And as somebody who's always thought long and hard about food, I started questioning about why, where does it make sense to, to raise certain types of food? And I was approaching it from like effective land use. And so it was, I, I stopped eating beef but only here in Ontario, because at the time I was naive about what that meant. Um, sometimes like for my work, I had to travel to say Alberta and there I would order <laughs> beef because out on the Great Plains, it made a lot of sense to have ruminants. Um, as my knowledge has increased, uh, it also let, oddly enough, it led to me becoming a farmer because I met Emily, my partner on this farm when, uh, and we had some discussions about that. I think I might have on the fir first day that we met, I might might have actually, we met in Toronto and I think I might have actually uh, ordered a veggie burger with bacon on it, which was always confusing to people. They're like, what? That doesn't make sense at all. Um, and that might be one of the night, that might be the night that I met Emily. And as I got to know her, first time I came here, I discovered that, I discovered that, um, I discovered that her her farm had two cattle on it 
And that's where my education about um, that there's a lot of places, especially on small farms, where raising livestock makes a lot of sense. Um, that it is a, an important part of the ecosystem of small farming and that my previous thinking about effective land use didn't make sense. And as we get into the politics of all of this, the other piece that I have to acknowledge is that while I'm a host of this and normally I, when I facilitate, I try to be a neutral facilitator. I also share all of this because I'm not, I can't admit neutrality in this discussion at all. I am I'm a farmer, I raise livestock, um, you know, and I believe that animals are an important part of a sustainable food system. And so I'm going to share some definitions um, around that and then introduce the folks that are here. Just Sydney, if you could advance to the next, yeah, the agenda, just so you can kind of see the timeline that we're on. We're going to try to cover a lot of ground in the next hour. Um, and we're joined by two people um, who I'm really excited to have us on, like on this lunch and learn. One is somebody, so Chef Josh Maharaj is somebody that I've actually had the pleasure of knowing prior to becoming a farmer when we were both working on community food security um, in Toronto. Um, personally, I think she's one of the few chefs in Canada who truly, truly, truly and deeply understands kind of social and environmental justice and food. And when we sat down a few weeks ago to kind of figure out how to involve her in this, like she's a chef, she's an author, she's an activist. You might hear on CBC radio, I believe it's on Mondays or is it more than just Mondays? It's Monday. Yeah. And I always, when I hear her on there talking about food and sharing tips on how to prepare food, it always brings a smile to my face. Um, Josh Noah was one of the first people that I got to hug outside my bubble a few weeks ago, post pandemic. Um, and yeah, we, we talked for hours about food. And so I'm really excited to have her join us to show us how to prepare some of these things. And then Katie from Tipsy Willow is somebody who I actually got to know two years ago through all of this. This is back when we were still just figuring things out on the fly. And I remember Katie and her partner, Jeanette, rolling up, you know, and with coolers, and we're trying to figure out how to do all of this together. We've learned a lot over the last two years together. And yeah, so as, as farmers, Katie and Jeanette, to share their knowledge about raising sheep, raising raising pigs, and, about, and a bunch more. Um, we'll get into it a bit more. The I'm hoping after this preamble, it looks like Joshna is now set up to to do a quick little in. I'll go into definition first, Joshna, just really quick, just to kind of establish some baseline information. But it looks like you're set up, which is good. Um, so when talking about definitions around food, especially livestock, there's so many out there. I tried to focus on ones that I thought were relevant to today's discussion. Um, and I'll preamble all of this by saying that when it comes to livestock and the sustainability of livestock, when I've looked at all of the research out there that claims that like raising livestock is a significant and major contributor to like greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, all of that data has focused on large scale industrial. I have looked long and hard to find what does it mean when you're a small farm raising livestock as part of a mix of other things or on pasture. And there's not a lot of evidence out there yet. I'm hoping some people are trying to progress that, um, but there's not a lot. So I'm not going to get into a lot of the data and facts and science of um, large scale industrial livestock and, it, and that contribution. Instead, I wanted to focus more on what the small farms that we're working with through Graze and Gather are attempting to do and accomplishing as they raise livestock. And one of the terms that you hear a lot is grass fed. And so all ruminants, cows, sheep, goats, right? Those are animals with four stomachs. They eat grass. So technically all of those are grass fed, but usually when you see it as a marketing claim, it's referring to kind of the last several months just before the animal gets processed. 
and whether or not they're just on a grass diet or if there's grains being introduced as well. So grains like corn and barley. Um, the history of that term actually goes back to when small farms and others were trying to make a distinction between how they were doing things and how large scale ag. Since then, grass fed has now become a catch all term that you hear everywhere. It's like grass fed beef, grass fed that. And so there's a lot of question marks around what that actually means because I don't believe it's a, I know in the United States, it's not a legal definition anymore. There's a lot of gray area around what it means in Canada. I'm a bit fuzzy on the specific legalities of is grass fed a, like an inspected term or not. Um, and I share that just because it's something we can explore some more. Uh, pastured is another term that's come up in probably the last, I want to say decade or so. Um, and it refers to raising livestock like out on the pasture, usually as a way of building up soil health, um, thanks to the manure, so that field crops can be planted in that pasture, right? So it's, and then the next slide gets into kind of more distinction of pastured, which is rotational grazing, a method where livestock have ac where their access to the full pasture, so you could be talking like acres and acres of pasture is actually controlled usually with movable fencing um, so that that pasture can be maintained uh, livestock have their preferences when it comes to what's growing out there and sometimes they will only nibble on their favorite stuff and trample and poop on everything else so this encourages them to actually like enjoy the full bounty on a section of pasture before moving them to a next piece and then often you see this in combination with uh, like multi-species rotational grazing where you could have one type of livestock, say sheep, followed by poultry, followed by planting of some sort of cover crop or other, um, other field crop that can actually then feed the animals later. The fourth definition that I wanted to share, because this is where small scale agriculture is like really thriving and that is on regenerative agriculture and it's this idea of rebuilding soil health there is a lot of evidence these days that um over the over the last decade like how or a hundred years or so that we have slowly extracted all, all of the nutrients all of the good out of the soil and that we risk desert for desert of our soil, you know, in the decades to come, unless we can figure out how to replenish that soil. And so regenerative agriculture is starting to look at what does that really healthy soil look like? What's the microbiome? What are all the, uh, the healthy uh, insects, um, fungi, everything else that's in there? And livestock have a role to play in that, you know, because when we remove livestock from from our fields, we were also removing all of their manure from it. So those are the four definitions that I just wanted to introduce really quickly, just to kind of establish some, like some baseline information for everybody as we get into the discussion. The final piece is just, as we talk about the animals themselves, um, is the cuts of meat. So just really quickly, um, as we talk about lamb and ham, this is just a quick overview of like where some of those different cuts come from. I will admit that like I raise pigs in partnership with a with a neighbor and we like learning the learning curve on how to raise them was one thing. And then when I found myself at market, I also had to learn all of the different butcher cuts, right? Because people would be like, well, what's this? And how's this? And I was like, I don't know. But I, obviously I learned fairly quickly and that's something small farms figure out as well. But you see like the ham is actually from the back legs, right? The hocks are kind of the, the legs themselves. Um, the, the shoulder or the butt roast, you know, is the, is the front leg of the pig. The belly is where the bacon comes from. The loin, you get two tenderloins and then off like from every pig. So that's why it's one of those desirable cuts. It is super soft, but you only get two per pig. Um, that's if you cut it up, otherwise you get a nice one big one you know, your loin chops, and then there are things you can do with the offcuts. Um, lamb is one that I'm less familiar with, having not raised it, but same idea, just as we get into the talks and everything. Um, 
one of the things that this doesn't show is the scale of a lamb versus a pig like a lamb is a much smaller animal uh so you're not talking as much meat as a pig you know but like this time of year you know it's you're really getting excited about lamb season and shanks and boneless or bone-in shoulders and legs and the lamb chops um and with all of that being said now i'm happy to turn it over to joshna who correct me if i'm wrong joshna are you ready to go with your kind of your your, your oh, prep my... so yes, with this one we'll... yes yes for sure yeah i tried breaking... to move this a little closer but it cut my head off there we go so we're passing it over to Joshna, who's going to share about 10 minutes of kind of the prep work of some of the dishes she's got planned. All of the recipes that Joshna put together for today are already up on Grow. So that's our knowledge section of the website, grow.grazinggather.ca, grazinggatherfood.ca, sorry. So Joshna, over to you. Okay, I rigged this up literally with a claw and my phone. So it is a very, uh, it's a risky move. And the potential, what happens before is sometimes the heat debilitates the phone. So let's get through this as quickly as we can and we'll see how we can pull this off. So hello, hello everybody. Uh, I wanna dive right in so you can see what's going on here. I really wanted you to watch me put a lamb curry together. So as we were talking about cuts, uh, right? Curries, especially ones that stew for a long time are a perfect way to use tougher cuts, uh, right? And and also the thing that's great with I've got the lamb shoulder here is that it's they're not oh they also don't cut up into perfect cubes right it, and this is a per perfect this is a great way to use that because all this beautiful meat is going to stew down into this very unctuous thing uh, we're not going to knife and fork is not really going to be part of this story so I want to show you an interesting a bit of an interesting hack on building the aromatic base for a curry. So this is, I'm giving you a very like standard North Indian approach to curry making here. So what I've got in the pan here uh, is a red onion and some garlic, ginger, green chilies. Uh, and that has been buzzed up into a paste in the food processor. So for real, don't have to worry about dicing onions or any of that nonsense. Food processor with a bit of water until it becomes a nice paste. And so I've got it here on medium high heat just to evaporate that water, right? And so we just are gonna get sort of essentially a concentrated aromatic flavor. And you can see it's sort of becoming more and more and more of a paste. Hopefully you can see that from your perspective. Um, so to do this, let's talk about spices. Uh, because the, the thing I find when I talk about Indian food is people are just like, oh Lord, there's all the spices and I can't, I don't have this and is this not gonna be good and all of those things. So let's do a little introduction here. Indian food uh, is not afraid of mega flavor. Uh, and that is an important thing. Oh wait, before the spices go in, here's an awesome little trick. And that is, you can see that most of the water uh, is out. We just sort of have the solids of the aromatics. And to that, we're gonna add some sunflower oil. Any veg oil would do. Ghee would be also, but lamb is a fattier meat. So the ghee, to be honest, might even be a bit of overkill. And that's not usually something you hear me say. Uh, but so now that the oil is in there, we're essentially just sauteing this lovely paste of aromatics. Uh, so just, I stir only to keep things from sticking to the bottom. That's it, just to keep things moving in the pan. And you can see, we're gonna do this until the color starts to turn. And we see, I'm not sure if you can see it in your screen, but until we see a little bit of a brown. Now, back to spices, here is my little collection here. Uh, and I have ground coriander, um, I have ground cumin, I have turmeric, I have fennel seeds, I have fenugreek leaves, and then I have cinnamon bark. I like the bark because I think it has better flavor than the stick uh, and any Asian grocery store will have these for you. So now that the sauteing has happened and we're just looking good, quite literally this whole mess of spices will go in. And this is a key move here. This is when we actually, they call this toasting the spices or I mean, the way I see it, it's like we want to cook the rawness out of the spices. Uh, speaking of that, I got a lot of pots on the stove. Uh, we want to cook the rawness out of the spices and you'll see it's this beautiful sort of paste that is uh emerging and so just you saw what we did it was not a ton of work 
a food processor was included. But basically, this stage to this sort of paste is where those bottled curries will take you, right? When they tell you it's like uh, Pataks or any of those other lovely folks, this is essentially they are skipping this whole flavor building process. I don't think it takes that long, and I think this version is much, much more delicious. All love and respect to the Patox family. Uh, I it, it doesn't take long for a sort of exponentially better thing. So uh, this is good. It should smell toasty, fragrant. You may need to open a window and turn on a fan, but that's sort of the magic of Indian food. Uh, next up is the lid. So I've got diced shoulder. Uh, it's beautiful stuff that came right from your farms. And what we want to do is just get that lamb all coated with that beautiful masala. In another context, perhaps in a wider pan uh, over potentially a stronger flame, you could sear this meat uh, and really get some browning happening. But it's not, not always necessary. And this is going to be super, super delicious regardless. And then to that, I'm adding a can of diced tomatoes and then another can of water. Right, just to clear it out and get all the goodness. Okay, we'll season uh, just lightly with a bit of salt. Our salt is more of a finish, but you, this is a, a key moment to add flavor. Uh, and so, literally, I stir all of this up uh, and then I'm going to keep it on high, cover it, uh, let it come to a boil, and then down to a simmer for a couple of hours hours uh and we will save the suspense for later on the call because i have one that i made yesterday uh and you can see how this beauty comes together so this is the look right and all you have to add is your good intentions put a lid on this beauty and let it uh let it do its thing so uh, uh katie i'm gonna hand this over to you to please tell, tell us about your farm and those sweet animals and all the lovely things my, my mouth is watering right now I'll just jump in really quick also because I, sorry, everybody, I forgot to say that if you have any questions, you know, by all means, yeah. at, like ask them along the way, uh, we get them and then we will kind of bring the QA or when it makes sense, we'll have those brought into the discussion as well. You can also show your enthusiasm with any of the emojis or anything like that. Okay. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I'm one of the farmers at Tipsy Willow Farm. You might have seen Jeanette. She kind of made an appearance and then ran away. She's a little camera shy. Um, but it was actually interesting hearing Dave's uh, journey with food because I have a bit of a similar one. So I'll just tell my quick story. Um, I met Jeanette on our mutual friend called Tinder. Um, I swiped right and won. Um, I said I was a farmer because I was farming on small scale organic farms in Prince Edward County. Um, and her said she was taking over her family farm. So I thought, jackpot, I get a farm out of this situation. So uh, my, my mom, who's actually watching this call right now, said, you know, she might be a livestock farmer because I was a vegetarian at the time. Um, so when I met Jeanette, I was a vegetarian and she was farming sheep. <laughs> um, and I actually was still a vegetarian um, when we first started with Graze and Gather and I was at market and people would ask me what it tasted like and I would just say, it's delicious. It's very zesty. You'll love it. So I started eating meat about a year and a half ago and I'm never going back. Bacon is delicious. Okay, so that's my little two cents. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are Tipsy Willow Farm. Um, these are, this is us. So Jeanette is technically the president, which I constantly like to tell her mom that Jeanette is actually the president of the farm. Uh, she's 26. She's also a volunteer firefighter and trying to get on um, volunteer. She grew up on the farm we are on now. Um, and she bought her first flock of sheep when she was 23. She bought 180 sheep. Um, her mom, Geraldine, who is honestly our Swiss Army knife, she can do anything. She grew up in Scotland on a farm with a thousand sheep um, on the island of Erin. Um, so she came to Canada, got a farm, has her own flock. She started, I think at one point she had about 500 to 600 sheep. She's downsized, although we can keep telling her to retire. She's not doing it, so we get to keep her. And then I am Katie. I... Uh, 
don't have a history in farming, but I jumped into it and I love it. And I keep buying animals that we do not need, but um, I'll keep doing it. So Kijiji is a dangerous place. Uh, you can go to the next slide now, please. So this is what we like to call the home farm. Um, we're sitting on 200 acres of land. Um, what I did on that first picture is where it has H's and P's. Those are our hay and pasture fields. So we run animals, as Dave said, we do pasture rotation. So we rotate all our animals through these fields throughout our season. So it's about six to eight months, our animals are on pasture rotating through these fields. And then once they rotate through, once hay season comes, we cut the hay, we bale it and we wrap it for winter. Um, the ones that are just have an H on it, those we can't, get the animals to um so they're just hanging and then we do have two ponds that the lovely geraldine dug with a backhoe um and then we have our house on the property we're also working with ducks unlimited to restore one of our wetlands um so that's a process right now because we have some wet areas that the animals can't graze just it's too wet and um, we can't get machinery in there to cut so um, we really are trying to restore the land um, and if you can see as well, we have two natural forested areas that we don't touch and we're trying to reforest um, all of our fence rows. So the areas in between the land. Um, and then we have three outbuildings because in the winter we bring our animals in because they are bougie and they hate the cold, to be honest. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So oh, the animals. We right now have about 300 sheep um we lamb them out which means we have rams on the farm we send the rams out at a certain time every year um they get marks on them so the rams wear these fun colored chalk and then it gets put on the backs of the females so we know who bred who and then i believe it five months later <laughs> we get cute little lambs um i think this year we lambed out uh 200 sheep i want to say um, some are just too young or, or some are old, which means we have to cull them. So um, we're just thinning our flock a little bit right now. We have 60 pigs. We raise our pigs. They're born on farm. We bring in a different boar. Um, my animal habit was water buffalo. I started buying water buffalo. First, I thought it was really funny because like, why not buy water buffalo? And now I can't stop. So we went from two to six and now we're at 11. Um, we have eight goats just for fun. We have laying hens and then we have uh, three pet ducks. Um, a big part of our regenerative agriculture and the reason we're able to pasture rotate our animals is our livestock guardian dogs, which are those beauties on the bottom. Um, Yukon, who looks evil in that photo, is 13. She's our oldest monster. Um, she's got a wonky eye because she's been in a couple of fights with coyotes. So those dogs go out to pasture with the sheep and because they're white, they look like the sheep. So when coyotes start to come towards our animals, the maramas go off and then the coyotes mistake the whole herd or the whole flock of sheep for dogs. So they will stay away from the area. Um, we also uh, use a lot of electric netting as Dave was talking about. So we move um, rolls of electric netting through our farm um, through the summer and that's how we get the sheep through different fields. We also choose to lamb our sheep because we have so many of them. We lamb our sheep inside in the winter. Um, so in November, end of November, early December, our sheep come off the field and then beginning of January, they start to lamb. Um, this just gives us more control and a lower mortality rate. So our goal is to keep as many lambs alive and as many animals alive as possible. Um, and so, yeah, those are our animals. And then next slide, Let's see what else they wrote. <laughs> so these are our processes. We do, as I said, pasture rotation, which is moving the animals through um, the field and then they poop along the way. We love poop. Um, and then we also um, collect all the manure from inside our barns that, um, built up over the winter and then that gets stacked out in the field it breaks down and then we have a two-year cycle of manure we have a manure spreader so you pick up the manure put it in the spreader and then 
spread that excuse me shit everywhere because we love poo like we don't use any chemical fertilizers we just love poo so um it's our one i love it so much to be honest <laughs> um and then the hay um that helps us get a thicker um higher yield hay we don't do any cropping we just have hay we cut bale and stack the hay um unfortunately last year was a really wet year so we had to wrap it um which isn't the best because it uses a lot of plastic but for the most part you let your hay dry out you bale it and then you stack it and that feeds our animals through the winter um we also have received funding to do delayed haying this year um which means we won't cut a select uh, i think it's 40 acres of our land until july 15th which means that the um birds that nest in the ground will not be disturbed so we'll leave those fields untouched until july 15th which lets all the animals that use that field to um, nest and have babies will be able to mature to the full extent um, we're reforesting and rewilding jeanette was a tree planter it's in her heart she plants trees wherever she can um, and then as i said we're doing our wetland restoration and then once it gets to the consumer because we love feeding people um, we really strive for nose to tail and grazing gatherers helped us with that so much because um, there's definitely a market for the more unusual cuts, the ovale, the liver. Um, we've also dived into jowl bacon, which is bacon off the cheeks of the pig. Um, it's a little, it's a little more like pancetta. It's really good. Um, our goal is to reduce food miles. That's one of our big regenerative things. Um, we want customers to be able to know where their food comes from and know how long it takes to get to them. Um, we also do minimal waste. So we take a lot of our waste products, such as our pig fat, we make skincare out of it. Um, it's really moisturizing. Uh, Jeanette shears sheep and we've started to get yarn made. And then we're trying to learn how to um, dry our skins out from after the sheep are processed. It's a process and has been a lot of YouTube watching, but we're getting there. Um, and then we're just always open to educating um, our customers and seeing how, and letting them know how the process happens. And then next slide. So for us, the future, it, it's always just more learning, um, but we have, we're opening a new farm stand um, so people can come see the farm. We're planting more trees. We're hoping to put out more meat boxes. We're always growing how many animals we have. We're gonna keep learning regenerative ways so that we can keep restoring our soil um, and keeping the system going. Um, more trees, more wetlands, more rotation. So just more of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's it for me. So if anyone, I don't know if you want me to do questions now or we'll wait till the end. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, classic mistake there. Um, there are a few questions coming in and so okay we're getting ones around um one do you sell any of your sheep skins right now no because they're they're not great they're a little tough right now <laughs> yeah okay um one was a question around like the cost the cost to the consumer of, of your meat and why it would be higher than say other other comparable cuts from other farms so comparing to industrial farm we're three people with a lot of farm a lot of bills um we try and keep our price as low as possible but we have to be able to sustain ourselves sustain our machinery um and be able to feed the animals so all of our costs and why maybe higher is just the amount of labor we have to put in um we are only one tractor and three people so it just takes a little bit more uh time i guess um and we feed a u ration um on occasion which is also more expensive than straight up corn so uh it's just the the added aspects that we have to calculate in okay that's fair um questions around like the processing itself where does that get done where does the slaughter happen anything like that so we're actually i can talk about provincial slaughterhouses all the time because they are a gift to small farmers um if you don't know small farmers we go to provincial abattoirs larger industrial 
farmers go to federal. In the last, I think, 10 years, Ontario and Canada as a whole has lost a substantial amount of provincial abattoirs. We are very fortunate um, at our location because we have an abattoir 10 minutes down the road from us, Hilt's Butcher Shop in Norwood. So we load the animals. We, You also, and Dave will know this, a lot of small farmers, because abattoirs are so busy right now, you have, I book all of my, my processing dates a year in advance. So I have to have an idea of how many animals we need to process. Um, we load into a trailer, we drive 10 minutes down the road, we drop them off. Um, it's a very quick process, I'll say, um, of the animal dying, and then they cut it there as well. Um, and then we pick it up a week later, and it's frozen, and we put it in our freezers. So, yeah. Nice. Thanks, Katie. And then the final one on this one is curious about kind of your usual mortality bottle lamb rate with your winter lambing. And the person also shares that they love seeing all the cool work that you're doing. Yeah, uh, this year we had a good year of bottle lambs. I think we lost six, six to 10, which is a good average for us. We had, when I first met Jeanette, we had a rough bottle lamb season. And I want to say we lost around 20. It just depends on the season and and um that year i believe we had pneumonia going through so um it just depends on the season but this year our bottle lamps have been strong um uh, if you do see us on instagram we have a i bring a lot of lambs in the house which uh jet's mom has tried to stop but i keep sneaking them in um and then it will top up lambs every so often if uh their mom is if the the ewe isn't producing enough milk so Overall, we've had an okay rate this year. Nice. Thank you. I do see more questions coming in to all of our guests, and we will get to them. I just want to pass, we want to make sure that we get to see Josh enough uh, with the rest of the yes. cooking. Okay. So passing it over to Josh, uh, then we'll amazing. get to see uh, Because I'm just plowing through a bit of stuff just to get things done. But I wanted to show you an interesting bit of technique. So I'm moving over to pigs. Uh, and we have some of the smoked ham here. So this was a beautiful ham steak that I got that I chopped up really fine. Uh, and then I have added it now to some mashed potatoes. We got some Yukons. There's some scallions, some whole grainy mustard, and an egg in here. So I, I've just mashed that all together. And essentially, I'm going to turn them into cakes like this. Let's see. There we are. You can see the cakes. But what I want to show you is the technique. So I have fingers, hands that are a little bit wet, and you just grab a ball of this mashed potato mix, uh, right? Again, a lot like making a hamburger, if you've done that before, into a ball, uh, in, into your palm, and then give it a little press. Now, here is the move. You want to use your hand, the sort of curve of your fingers, to line it up because that's how your cake gets uh, some vertical action, right? And so you do a little little squeezy patty roll around until you get the hockey puck that we're looking for here, right? We want something with sides on it, uh, right? And there you go. You can see it's much like, like a little scone that you would cut out. Um, and so then this will just get an easy dredge in some flour. Uh, and I've got a pan of hot oil behind me that will just brown these beauties up. So that is the potato cake. I'm going to hand it back to you, Dave, for more questions, but I wanted you to see that technique because crab cakes, appetizers, using the crook of your of your finger and your thumb is a key, uh, key move to doing that shaping piece. Nice. Thank you, Josh. Now, there's actually one for you that I think would be really interesting, and it's a food history question for Josh now, when it's a good time. Okay. So tomatoes, potatoes seem like a staple of Indian cooking, but I believe they're a new world food. What was used as a base for curries and stews before tomatoes were used? Uh, yes, uh, they are both imports, which is so amazing. And in fact, I once uh, uh, saw a panel discussion with Mother Joffrey, who is like everybody's Indian mom, uh, but she probably one of the first people to write a cookbook about Indian food for Western people. Uh, and she's a famous cookbook writer, author, all this. But she said so sweetly, she said, yes, uh, uh, the, the, the potato was introduced, I think sometime in the 18th century, uh, into Indian cooking. And she's like, 
but look at what we did with it. <laughs> Which I thought was amazing. Uh, because really my people dove into the potato for sure. So previous to that, there would have been more uh, different kinds of uh, roots and tubers, uh, right? Lots of yam, a lot of that Chinese yam-like stuff. Uh, there's some things I only know the Hindi words for, but very cassava like with those rough skins particularly further south in india uh the potato uh, i think that it really filled a space in the indian in the in the culinary landscape for india which is why we dove into it so well because it is such a trustable neutral medium uh right for us to attack things with chilies and masala and all of that uh, other of uh, um, aside from the tomato we, we, we'd be looking at different other fruits, right? Other tropical fruits, super, super ripe ones uh, that would be used as base. Also, um, a lot of just the juices in the meats and things like that, if, if meat was involved, lots of vegetarian cooking. Um, but I mean, the truth is part of the reason why it feels so hard to believe that the tomato and the potato are not indigenous Indian things is because of how well they were uh, you know what I mean? How well they've literally been absorbed by the cuisine. It's like Indian cuisine was waiting for potatoes and tomato and chilies. Chilies are also not indigenous, right? We were waiting for that to sort of really live our full potential with it. Amazing. Okay, thank you. Um, there's two similar type questions, and I hope the people that pose them are okay with me kind of combining them. One was just interested in how this entire subject relates to local food security. And the related one was, can small farms feed our entire population in Ontario sustainably? And forgive me, I'm gonna take off my facilitator hat for a second and just attempt to answer that because it gets to the heart of what we're attempting to do with Graze and Gather. And it's this idea that small farms, like you heard from Katie, it's true of myself, it's true of all of us that are part of this thing. We have the capacity and the willingness to grow a lot more food. We don't have the capacity to sell more food ourselves by attending additional farmers markets and spending more time on the road. Like truthfully, in my first three years, I spent more time in my truck than I did in my fields growing food. And I would love to spend more time growing food. And that's true of every single one of the farms that I've talked to. And so what has been needed for a long time is another way to get this food to people. And it's been, truthfully, it's been talked about for over a decade of the missing middle of the food system. The local food system is the supply chain, the logistics, the cold storage, the trucks on the road. Um, and with respect to the people that did a lot of the talking about it, there was never any action on it. And that's what we're trying to do now is say, we can. I fully, fully believe that small farms can feed our population. Um, you look at the data globally, and that's true. You look at the data locally, and it has the potential. But we need the ability to actually get our food to people without doing the growing, the driving, the marketing, the distributing, everything ourselves. So the where where this is going next is like we're getting smarter about how to work together and coordinate our efforts um so the, sorry that's my take on it and i sorry i've put my facilitator hat back on right now and katie or joshna do you have any insights into this because i know it's kind of a something we all get asked a lot well one thing that i think is really important to say is that one of the most important things about meat-based connections and our local food sort of landscape is the fact that it is a, that it is strong and robust and that we have a way to opt out of the industrial commercial option right this is, is perhaps one of the biggest eye openers for folks who were not connected to local grassroots sort of sourcing uh every, I, I i literally had people say to me oh my god i I had no idea that I could just buy my food directly from a farmer. Uh, and the fact that that is news and a novel surprise is just an indicator of exactly how sharp the corner is that we have turned on our, you know, in our relationship with our food system. So to me, it feels integral, uh, right? It's, it is not something to lose. And to hear actually, to hear Katie, to hear you say that local abattoirs uh, are enough and that they have been doing that task uh, sort of 10 years ago, one of our main concerns was about finding abattoirs for local farm, you know, for local farmers raising animals well. 
uh, to find access to this. So I'm thrilled to hear that some of that movement and growth has happened and that this is an easier process for you uh, than, it, let's say, historically it has been here. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Dave, because I think the first year, so three years ago, I spent most of my time driving. I hate driving now because it was just trying to get the product to customers and Grazing Gatherers help because you expand our market now um, to reach more people. And I think a lot of small scale farmers, smaller scale farmers um, have the capacity to raise animals and grow these products. It's those middle um, transportation and storage and and all these other hats that we have to put on that that can limit the potential of our products. Nice. So this is getting into some really good discussion with with on the Q and A side of things. Um, Dina, I see yours. I see two of them. We will get to both of them. The first, the just is where we're heading with the conversation. We want to tackle the one that you posed, where it's like, in what ways would small farms have to change in order to grow a lot more food? So, and I'm 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 assuming that you mean like, are there trade offs around growing more food and the sustainability side of this? I'm so I'm just going to pose that. Katie, if you want to, like, are there trade-offs to growing more food and the sustainability goals? Are there other, any other changes that need to happen on the farm? Big question. Okay. For us right now, I don't see it because Jeanette's mom used to run more animals than we did. And she's always, we've always farmed the same way. She's, she's OG regenerative agriculture before it had a name. So I, I don't think we'd have to change that much. Um, but I get again, it just comes down to having the consumer base to actually want it or know how to get it. Um, but, but overall, I think a lot of farms are able to increase their um, their yield without having to uh, to change their methods. Because for us, we're doing it this way anyway. So if if it's ten sheep or if it's five hundred sheep, we're going to do it the same way, and it's. It, in our sense, like, well, you know, we started with two water buffalo and I, when I wanted, when I said, can we get more? I was like, well, we're already doing it with two. Let's just do it with 15. So I think that's our, our way of looking at it. And I think a lot of other farmers, it's like, go big or go home at this point. <laughs> yeah. Building off that, I think it's the, it's not going big and sacrificing the values, right? It's, it's actually, well, I think. I guess in business language, it's the economies of scale that you can achieve. For us as small farms, I think we're looking for the economies of sustainability. Like there's capacity to grow more and do it more efficiently, more effectively, but while still respecting the people that we work with on the farm and the environment that supports the farm and that we're getting really creative on what that all looks like. Um, there's kind of a follow-up question that I think is related, and this is a tricky one. So Lauren, thank you for asking it. And it's around the prices of these things, right? Um, and that the price point for local sustainable food, you know, can be a barrier for folks, right? That it's not accessible to everybody, you know, and is there a way around this is her question. Um, Joshna, do you want to take a stab at that one around the affordability and accessibility of local sustainable food? For sure. Uh, there's a couple of things to say. And one is that it is a constant struggle, right? I remember uh, I worked at the stop when the Green Barn opened and there was a farmer's market there. And originally we offer volunteers tokens for their return trip to come and volunteer at the stop. Uh, and we thought maybe that equivalent in market dollars would be the way we could, you know, uh, compensate volunteers a little bit for their time and effort. But we discovered very clearly, very quickly, that $6 did not buy very much at the farmer's market. And that was super discouraging for community members. And it was a problem that, to be very honest, we have not resolved, right? Because, yes, that is, it is a barrier for people. Uh, and the notion that somebody... Uh, living on a fixed income or with poverty has $6 to spend on a loaf of bread is nuts. That $6 has to go much further than that. But it's not going to happen on the backs of our farmers, right? Which is historically sort of the way this has gone. And we just sort of beg farmers for charity and discounts, uh, but that is not a sustainable system. Uh, and so, 
So it's in, the, to me, one of the only things that's really going to get us to the place we need to be on this are ideas around guaranteed basic income. Uh, because really, this is about people's capacity to be able to afford to buy themselves good food uh right to me that is that is a clear uh clear piece um and so that is the thing that i would like to see more because the externalities of the industrial food system are well hidden for a reason right we do not see them we do not pay them which is why we now have this real distortion in our minds about what food is worth and how much we're willing to pay and that unfortunately that is the <laughs> that is the, the mountain that all of us us here are sort of attempting to climb. Uh, can I just pull your attention here for a moment to the pan? I want to show you uh, the speediest carbonara, and that carbonara can be made with ham, not only bacon or pancetta, which is very exciting. So more of this beautiful um, smoked ham from Katie and Jeanette, and I've just sort of uh, seared it off with a shallot. Super, super simple. Olive oil is here. I have two yolks and a and a full egg plus some of Monforte's Toscano uh, in lieu of Parmigiano Reggiano. Don't tell anybody Italian. Uh, and I have pasta boiling. So essentially, what is going to happen is uh, off. I'm going to turn the heat off on this pasta. It will go in and it'll be a bit of a dramatic shakeup. Uh, but I think I need another like 30, 90 seconds on the pasta. Maybe I'll shoot it back over to you, Dave, for a little question. And then I'll just quickly pull your attention when the magic is about to happen. Okay. Um, Katie, this one is for you then. And it is a question that all of us small farmer, small livestock farmers get. And it's that you seem to like to like your animals. Is it hard to send them for slaughter? Yeah. I've cried multiple times sending them. Um, like for instance, uh, I I name a lot of my animals, and I was doing a video with a girl guide group, and they could not wrap their heads around that. But um, yeah, we raise we we love our animals. We put blood, sweat, and tears into our animals. We like to say they live a better life than us uh, because they have someone feeding them and cleaning up after them all day. Um, it's hard, but knowing that we're create we're doing it to the best of our ability in a regenerative way. It's a quick, I know the way it's being done is fast and, and people are still going to eat meat. So as hard as it is, it, it has to happen. We also, my thing, especially with pork, um, is domestic pigs do not stop growing. They will continue to grow until their quality of life is not great. So we had a boar who was near 900 pounds. So, we we send the pigs in like our sows have about three litters and then they go to butcher and yeah i cried sending willie off but she was at a point where her quality of life was going down um lambs are a bit trickier but then i also remind myself that they love to headbutt me so um it just it, it's hard and we're, we don't love it but it, it's part of our business so you get used to it unfortunately read and i'll share that it's the like I, I say thank you to all of them every time, right? Yeah. Okay. I tell my students a lot about the bad day. Yes. The and one I bad day. Well, our students. I was like, everything else is pretty great. Just one bad day out there on the farm. So I think it's a related question that kind of just came in and it's like with small farms, pigs and other animals will live the full extent of their lives, or are there exceptions? So I think just some clarity on the life cycle or lifespan of farm animals. Yeah. So yeah. lambs, they, they're they lambs. They're not sheep. Nobody really likes mud in anymore. So um, we raise our lambs to 80 pounds, which is about six months. Um, unfortunately, on the farm, you don't want to be a boy. So um, all of our male animals will get sent first uh, because we keep the females back to breed. So at about six months, 80 to 100 pounds, our lambs go in. Uh, pork, we slow raise our pigs, um, which means we don't push feed on them. And we have heritage breeds, so they're slower growing. So we're looking at anywhere from six months to a year um, on our market pigs. And then our sows, uh, after they have given birth, we send them after about three or four years. Um, our water buffalo, we send in our old girls, uh, and we just get ground back. and then. My sister-in-law and brother-in-law were Shaylin Farms. Uh, 
this and they're I don't I'm not like 100 percent sure on beef, but but it, I think it's over a year, around a year beef goes. So they live the best life possible in that time, uh running and frolicking. And then yeah, one bad day. Okay. okay. Um I'm gonna open here. Uh carbonara action is happening. So the pasta is cooked. And we're not even going to worry about draining. I've got it here in a little pot. And it is cooked just before al dente. Because a little extra cooking is going to happen in the pan. And if you don't already know this, the secret to delicious pasta is putting the pasta in the pan with the sauce. Key move here. So I'm just pulling this is spaghetti. And I'm pulling it out and adding it right into the pan with the ham and the shallots. And you'll see that I'm not being that fussy about having pasta water drip in. Uh, right? This is one of those beautiful things uh, Italy has really taught us about the glory of uh, pan juice sort of pasta sauce. So I'm going to save a bit of pasta water because this starchiness is what helps out. And now I'm cutting the heat underneath. Uh, and we're just going to coat this beautiful pasta in all those pan juices and you can see it's already drinking it up now here is the move i've got eggs yolks cheese salt and pepper all in this one move because once you do the toss it happens fast uh off the heat heat is off so you can either move it or just turn the burner off underneath and work it in very fast uh you want to get all that goodness off of the spoon uh but you want to toss uh, and toss and a little bit of pasta water helps to loosen things up you'll see that beautiful gorgeous creaminess is emerging and this is the like everybody should be at the table at this point right this is going to happen quickly uh and you can see that gorgeous creaminess is exactly what we're looking for oh my god this is my lunch today so to this, all we're gonna add is some fresh parsley. Uh, and of course, uh, another hit of Ruth's gorgeous Toscano. Uh, it's a great local Parmesan stand-in. Uh, and then here's a nice little bit, just a squeeze of lemon, just to brighten things up. And you can see, right, you can really see what pasta water has done here. This is sort of goo and cheesy and gorgeous with all those beautiful yolks. Uh, there it is. That is easy, fast ham carbonara. I'm going to hand it back and all I will do is pull the curry for you to see that and to take a look at a soup and then we're done here in the kitchen. Amazing. Um, well, we're actually coming up right on time. We're a minute away. Um, just some I'll share the accolades that we're getting in for both of you. Um, you know, Katie and Jeanette, thanks for all your hard work using regen egg methods. Uh, Josh, no, you're amazing. Um, would you consider starting your own cooking show one day, Cooking and Food Politics? I would totally watch, subscribe. My thanks to everyone. Yeah. This was really I'm trying interesting. To do that. Yeah. Um, Dina, I'll apologize because I love the question and I'll share it with everybody and maybe I'll invite people to stay on because we'll try our best to answer it. Um, but respecting if people do need to leave, understand that. But Dina's question that I thought was really interesting was like, wouldn't we need to put aside more land if we're growing the same amount of food as industrial farms, but on pasture or with regenerative ag methods? So this is a really fascinating one around scale, I think. And like, are we talk, like, can the entire food, food needs of the global population be met through sustainable, like pastured regenerative agriculture? Um, if anyone wants to take that on. I'll, I'll, let me jump in because I want to show you what I've done here. First of all, yeah. uh, it's not as much of a problem because commercial industrial growing is terribly inefficient, uh, right? They say that it's more efficient because they cram more in one space but that does not actually make the yield that we're looking for. Uh, so there are definitely, we don't, it's not the dramatic space issue that I think a lot of people have suggested it is. Uh, Katie, please uh, prove, uh, chime in there if that is not accurate. Uh, but I wanna pull your attention here. This is uh, a Quebecois split pea soup, but I've got one of the beautiful ham hocks from the farm in here. So it couldn't be easier 
a bit of butter, saute onions and carrots and celery, split peas go in. And then you can see this hawk has really broken down. It's in pieces. Uh, there's some fresh thyme, whatever is sort of out in your garden and, or, or in pots. And then you just let this simmer. The recipe would have had me puree this, but I really love this texture. I think it's gorgeous. I would hit this with some more, some parsley and a bit of lemon with lentils. And I think it's delicious with some crusty bread. It's a perfect wintertime lunch or like end of winter lunch with the last little bit of storage, poor little storage carrots kicking around. So one more thing to show you, and that is the big finish on this lamb curry. So here is the one that I made last night. Um, you can see it has really cooked down uh, the bits of lamb, and that's a cinnamon stick pushing out there. It's so funny, right? The French kitchen doesn't want to see bits of cinnamon stick, but the Indian kitchen lets you know the, all the authentic things that are in there. So here it is, really unctuous. The one garnish that's important is coriander stems. They're so so much beautiful flavor and they get tossed a lot, uh, but the Indian kitchen says no. And so we're gonna garnish this with coriander stems. Uh, and, and look, nothing will escape that, that blanket of coriander when this would go to the table, but the fresh sort of bright crunchiness of this is really compelling in this curry that is super rich because lamb's got a good bit of extra fat. Um, Katie, I'm very sorry that I can't just give this to you to eat. I, would I know. Um, I haven't had lunch, so I'm like drooling over here. Like, all right. <laughs> so this is it. It is the leave it for, you know what I mean? Spend an afternoon with this sort of simmering away on the stove. Serve it with uh, fresh flatbread or rice. And I want to show you, I found a recipe recently for a raita, which is just a yogurt dish. But it is, if you can believe it, it's with beets. So it is this glorious, beautiful color, which I had never seen before. Uh, so the beet raita with a bit of lamb curry and some basmati rice or a little naan that you cooked over a fire or a grill or something. Gorgeous, perfect woo, winter meal. And so we did it. You've seen everything. Uh, we did it. We did it. Thank you. Thank you to all of the Breeze and Gather farmers whose beautiful things ended up on my counter here. And for those of you watching, uh, I'm sending you recipes. You can recreate all of this in your kitchen. I had simply a bit of shoulder, a hawk, and some of the ham steaks and other things, potatoes, carrots, that are likely just kicking around your kitchen. So delicious things are still available. Uh, really, really easy, really, really simple. These eggs that you get from the farm are perfect for a carbonara. Okay, enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joshna. Uh, Katie, do you want to, do you want, do you have anything to say on that question about land use, the ability, like? Oh, it, there's fully the ability to do it. Um, what people probably don't know is that a lot of regenerative farmers like share, share land or rent land. So if you have someone who lives on land, that's not farming it, that they'll rent it out to other farmers. So there's, there's definitely the ability. And I don't think industrial, industrial agriculture is doing worse things because they only feed corn and don't use pasture. And, you know, it means more monocropping and all these other things. So it's definitely there. It's just a full change in the system that would be required. Uh, so it's, it's a big topic, but it, it's definitely possible. Yeah, it's a big topic. And I know we like this. We only had an hour together. We covered a lot of amazing ground. Um, for my part, what I'll do is I like there's there is some amazing work being done by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, of which there's a couple of brilliant people based out of Toronto that are part of that. that they just came out with a report that looked at all of this regenerative agriculture and its role in the future of food. Um, the University of Guelph has a whole feeding nine billion focus that we can share some resources on. So there's a lot more learning and discussion that can happen. And we'll share out some things in our upcoming newsletter with if people want to dig into this some more. Um, you know, it's yeah, obviously, you can tell like, we're all very, very passionate about not just growing and eating and preparing food, but all of the other elements of it as well. Um, so Joshna, thank you so much for, for sharing your expertise and skills and passion. Katie, likewise, I love it. Can't wait to see you and come out. I'm going to be coming out to the farm soon to do something with you um, and to talk some sheep. Um, and to all of the guests today, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we would love to hear your feedback. It's not a form, like we 
you know us, we're not going to send you a survey and everything. But if you have feedback for us about today, about these lunch and learns and about like anything, little things that we could maybe do a little bit better, things that you think that we're absolutely nailing it on, would love that because we want to have these discussions with you and with a lot more people about food. So thank you to everybody for being part of this today. And yeah, excited for the next one, which will be the end of April and where we're going to be looking at foraged food.